Making better sense of ourselves and others has always been central to leadership. But today, the stakes continue to rise when we get it wrong. In this show, we talk to Chris Voss, a former FBI hostage negotiator whose masterclass is the platform's most downloaded show and whose book, Never Split the Difference, has sold more than 2 million copies worldwide. We talk about what Chris has learned about how empathy is a super skill in understanding others' intentions and needs and his robust belief in the power of authenticity and integrity as a cornerstone of leadership. His experience in the toughest of human interactions brings to life the perennial wisdom of how we can build trust and that when we're negotiating, we often benefit from not giving in to our compulsions. Tune in for an amazing conversation with the brilliant Chris Voss. Welcome to The Evolving Leader, a show born from the belief that we need deeper, more accountable and more human leadership to confront the world's biggest challenges. I'm John Gomes and today I'm joined by my colleague and wellbeing specialist, Sarah Jeschamp. Hi Sarah, how are you feeling? Hi John, I think I'm feeling intrigued, but I think that's like not even close to describing how I'm feeling, but we'll go with intrigued today. Very excited to speak to our guest. How are you feeling? Uh, I'm feeling amazingly excited about this conversation. I've um, read our guest's books in the past. Um, actually, I, I read one. I remember uh, where I was on a flight to L.A. reading it uh, on the plane the whole way through, and I consumed the whole book in one reading. Um, and uh, I think I shared it with about half a dozen friends straight after that. So, yeah, I'm... Um, I'm also uh, feeling a bit on high alert because today we're joined by Chris Voss. He's a leading expert on the art of negotiation. As a 24-year veteran FBI negotiator, Chris changed the game in negotiation from one of stoicism to that of tactical empathy, persuading kidnappers, terrorists and bank robbers to see things his way, saving countless lives in the process. And Chris has translated his high-profile experiences and synergy of collaboration and empathy into his negotiation consultancy, the Black Swan Group, where he and his team of expert hostage negotiators apply negotiation skills in business contexts to help their clients make better deals, develop new relationships and uncover valuable pieces of information the other side is hiding. He's also a successful author. His book, Never Split the Difference, which I was referring to earlier on, explores how everything is a negotiation and how anyone can use FBI negotiation tactics to solve problems, get what they want and resolve conflicts in all aspects of their life. He's a household name on the Masterclass platform um, where he's garnered a following for his accessible courses that teach everyone how to better communicate using behavioral science and human nature. Chris represented the US government as an expert in kidnapping at the international conference sponsored by the G8 before becoming the FBI's lead international kidnapping negotiator. Chris served as the lead crisis negotiator for the New York City division of the FBI. He's also a member of the New York the City Joint Terrorist Task Force for 14 years and negotiated notably the surrender of the first hostage taker to give up the Chase Manhattan bank robbery. And if that isn't enough, he's also the recipient of the Attorney General's Award for Excellence in Law Enforcement and the FBI Agents Association Award for Distinguished and Exemplary Service. So Chris, welcome to The Evolving Leader. And I apologize. That took so long. I know we got a lot of air time. <laughs> We're almost out of time now. Thanks for everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs> See you on the next episode. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I mean, Chris, that is an extensive resume. Uh, the first question we want to ask you, we ask at the beginning of every episode is, how are you feeling today? Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I'm a, I'm a morning person. You guys have got me in the sweet spot of my day. So I'm, I'm energized, optimistic, and playful. Wonderful. Can we start at the beginning? What's the origin story of your fascination with negotiation? Uh, it was mostly because it was an aspect of crisis response in law enforcement. Uh, I was a member of the SWAT team. Yeah, I was a cop in Kansas City, then an FBI agent, a terrorist task force. But I was also a member of the SWAT team. I like crisis response because um, 
A response to crisis requires decision making. And I'm comfortable in action is sort of the bane of my existence. You know, procrastination, not to decide, is to decide. I've always hated that. And I think it's one of the most costly things in everybody's lives. So uh, I had a recurring knee injury and didn't want to end up a cripple as a SWAT guys. So we had hostage negotiators and they were part of crisis response. And I didn't think it's, it, it didn't look that hard to me. So I thought, well, <laughs> let me try this hostage negotiation thing, see how it works out. And it ended up making me happier than anything else ever did. So I'm struck by this term tactical empathy. How did that approach differ from conventional negotiation approaches that you were learning as part of your craft? Well, it was really more to try to get people to accept that empathy was not the same thing as sympathy. Yeah. Um, people that are afraid of sympathy. And empathy and sympathy are com two completely different things, even though synonymous in today's uh, vernacular. You know, I have, I, have, I have empathy with you. I have empathy for you. People are always trying to express sympathy with that. On the crisis hotline way back when, they drew the distinction immediately. They said sympathy is when you get in somebody's quicksand with them and then both of you are stuck. Nobody gets out. So I always knew that empathy was different than sympathy. Most of the rest of the world doesn't because of the way it's used. So the first idea was to put tactical in front of the word to sort of decouple it from agreement mm -hmm. or sympathy and get people that were afraid of it to think empathy is weakness, which is just absurd um, to get them to not be afraid of the word. Then as we learn more about neuroscience and the book has been out on uh, eight years now. And so there's a lot of neuroscience that has been uncovered while the book was coming out and even since. And really it's a neuroscience honed application of emotional intelligence. It's neuroscience is a hard science. Psychology is a soft science. You get a, you have a psychology convention and none of the psychologists are going to agree on anything. Mm. Well, the neuroscientists, they might disagree on, what part of the brain does what, but they don't really disagree on the outcomes or the neurochemicals. It's, it's hard science. And tactical is really, you know, the intentional use of people smarts. Hmm. And, and just before we go on, Sarah, I was wondering in terms of your understanding of empathy um, as an individual, rather than the intellectual kind of understanding of the distinction between these things, how, how did you come to understand yourself in that sense and your ability to be empathetic towards others? Is this something that was kind of inherent in you? Is it something that you've developed? How did, how did that kind of understanding develop in you? Well, if empathy is just observation and then the articulation of that observation, it's in many ways, it's getting out of your own way. Uh, in, on the hotline, you know, we had to be non-judgmental. Uh, and that sounds simple, but... Mm. In application, it's very hard. And then even taking it to an extreme degree as a hostage negotiator, I got to negotiate successfully with somebody from Al-Qaeda, you know, somebody from any extremist organization. I'm never going to agree with them. Uh, probably it's going to be hard for me to have sympathy for them unless I know their origin story. And, and they grew up in, in squalor, if you will. I, I remember seeing the documentary one day in September about the uh, Black September terrorists. And one of them was talking about the squalor that he grew up in in the refugee camp. And he'd originally thought of himself as a wretched refugee. And so then you have an understanding, not an agreement, but an understanding. And to me, then when I was taught that from the beginning, I thought, oh, that's simple. I do empathy. I don't have to agree. I just have to understand. I love that. And Maybe to keep going with this, it's, it's related. Uh, you talk a lot in your in your leadership and your thought leadership about connecting with authenticity, connecting with trust based influence. And can you talk a little bit more about how you create this? So maybe perhaps giving us examples of situations where the outcome deferred when you adopted authenticity and when you adopted that idea of trust based influence. Yeah, well, I think authenticity should be everybody's currency. And many people are afraid of that or, you know, my, my, um, my credibility is my currency. And a lot of people are afraid of being honest. They don't know how to be honest. You know, it's, it's extremely common for people to say, 
Well, we didn't necessarily tell them the whole truth. We just didn't lie. Well, that's errors. You know, that's deception by omission. It's very common in the business world. And it's kind of common in human interaction. Not because we intend to be deceptive or we have a malicious intent in mind. It's that people don't know how to tell the truth. So authenticity, you really got to kind of start from that from the very beginning. In the United States, and I'm sure it's a common phrase globally or similar phrases, we love straight shooters. What's a straight shooter? Somebody who tells the truth, somebody who doesn't hide things, but they do it in an emotionally intelligent way. They make, they make sure the words land and it starts with tone of voice and it starts with really being honest, which is a much bigger challenge than most people are aware of in, in a day-to-day -day life. You know, how, how am I always honest? How do I avoid the white lies? Um, and then white lies, if you accept them, then the definition of a white lie becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, depending upon who you are. Pretty soon, you're scared to tell anybody the truth. So authenticity has really got to be the cornerstone that you build from. And have you seen a situation where the outcome was completely different because you adopted that. Can you give us an example of what that could look like in practice? Well, and, and all right, so hostage negotiation example that springs to mind earliest is, is uh, one that um, sounded horrifying, but it was one of my early trainings. There's this, there's this hostage taking, I believe it's in Portland, Oregon, and possibly in some, in some office building. Now, there's guy wants to commit suicide by cop. But he's got this really bizarre way of doing it. And, and suicide by cop is uh, a problem in any hostage situation. You didn't know that the bad guy didn't go there to die. You got to understand whether or not he went there to die. And this guy's elaborate circumstance was he was going to go to this office building, commit capital murder, murder someone. And then law enforcement was going to take him into custody and he'd be found guilty and be given a death penalty. So he goes to this office and he shoots several people. And they're drug out and the siege is on. And the people he shoot don't die. So the hostage negotiators at this point in time have been talking to him. They know what his plan is. Now, the people that he shot are at the hospital. And it's going to get out in the media that they're going to live. And so they're confronted with, do we engage in deception by omission and pretend like we don't know this? This guy is probably going to find out. Before we get them out, where does that lead us? Do we call them and tell them in an effort to preserve our credibility, our authenticity? Do we want him to believe that we will never lie to him, no matter what the consequences? And they go back and forth. And you can imagine the thinking, like, if we call him and tell him that he hasn't killed anybody yet, he's going to kill people. And they debate it in, internally, and the negotiators make the decision to call him and tell him that the people he shot are going to survive. And he ends up bonding to them so much because he's just overwhelmed at their desire to never lie to him, to not hold anything back from him, that they end up talking him out as a result. He doesn't hurt anybody else but their intention to maintain their credibility, no matter what. And in point of fact, that should be everybody's intention, because if you lie to somebody, they're going to find out. And when they find out, they're never going to trust you again. So how do you how do you get out in front of that? I mean, you, you just you got to maintain your credibility. And, and the other thing about lying, too, is many times it's a, it's a test. You know, I say I don't lie to people because they're better liars than I am, and they're going to figure it out. They're going to test me to see if I will lie to them. Or potentially, if they're a better liar than me, they're going to smell it right away, and I'm going to lose my long-term influence. And I'm, I'm about long-term influence and credibility. I got another kidnapping that I'm working in Saudi Arabia. Um, this is 2004, and Saudi Arabia is a very different place these days. Uh, much more well-organized, well-run, uh, regardless of what you think of, of the government there. I mean, that's, Saudi is making phenomenal gains in the world. And they were tolerant of factions of al-Qaeda in their country in that time frame. And al-Qaeda takes some hostages 
and they've got a guy that they are threatening Paul Johnson. They're threatening to kill him on deadline. And we think it's probably going to happen, which in, in point of fact, it, in, it ends up happening. Now I'm talking to his then wife, his widow to be, and his boss as we're getting ready to make a statement in the media. And we're coaching her. She's very coachable. She's willing to do whatever we want her to do. And as we're discussing with them the strategy, his boss looks at me and says, if she does this, is this going to save him? And I looked at him and I said, this probably isn't within reach. And he looked at me and he said, I didn't think so. I just wanted to see if you're going to lie. We're going to do everything you ask. So you got to, you know, you got to get out there. Your, your, your currency has got to be your integrity. So this is fascinating because in this situation, in the previous um, scenario, the pressure to lie because telling the hostage taker the truth might result in him killing other people to fulfill his prophecy uh, or his out desired outcome. Is there ever any a situation where the stakes are so high that you would compromise on that? Or do you just think this is something that you always lose by doing that, by lying? Yeah, no, my experience is you always lose. I mean, you have yeah. set yourself up for a trap that there's no coming back from. And, you know, I live in Las Vegas, so, but I've always used a Las Vegas analogy. Like, nothing is guaranteed. There is no, there is no guarantee of success. What you need is the optimum approach. The optimum game theory approach is what a friend of mine uh, described it as recently. What's going to work for me more than anything else? Just because I can see how this is going to go bad. Like, you yeah. can see how everything's going to go bad. Uh, nothing is guaranteed. What gives me my optimum success? My optimum success comes from integrity and preserving that integrity. And, yeah, every now and then something's going to go bad. Yeah. The problem is not preserving your integrity goes bad more often yeah. than preserving it does. Absolutely love that. That's such a clear-sighted um, perspective on this. So let, let, let's just kind of add another um, element into the mix of, of complexity. So you, you've got these very high stakes negotiations, but you've also got such a diverse range of cultures and backgrounds and moat drives. How do you navigate all of that? I was in a negotiation conference about 10 months ago. Uh, it's in Europe. I believe we're in Germany. Uh, it was a conference of negotiation thought leaders, practitioners, uh, academics, all the people who's very much specializing in negotiation. Of course, there's a cross-cultural negotiation expert there. On his premise, exactly what you were just saying. He says, you got to understand Germans to negotiate with Germans. you got to understand Asians. you got to understand Italians. you got to understand all these different cultures to navigate and he's familiar enough with my work, which is all of us are humans. And what you really need to do is understand humans. Yeah. But he's pitching this, this culture, that culture, this culture. And he can tell from the look on my face that I'm just not <laughs> buying. And finally, he blurts out to me, everybody just wants to know that you know where they're coming from. <laughs> and I said, bingo, that's empathy. That's exactly what I teach. Everybody. He didn't say only Germans want to know, or only Italians want to know, or only Chinese want to know. He said everybody. And the definition of empathy, tactical empathy, is showing people that you understand where they're coming from, or this is what you do understand by your articulation, and then being open to correction. So they want to know if I got it, everybody. And then the second part, open to correction. There is nothing more satisfying than correcting another human being. And if I'm open to being corrected, uh, you're, you're, you're Arab, you're Chinese, you're South American, you're whatever. Because you're a human being, you're going to love that. So it's, we are humans first. Like I'm white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Midwestern man, grew up in Iowa. If you take me as a baby, if the, if the gypsies kidnap me as a child and they drop me in the middle of 
a former Soviet republic that's Asian. That's who I am going to look like. Because as human beings, we start as a blank slate. We're human beings, period. And we're all born with the same wiring. What's the the mix between, um, and I, I probably kind of know the answer based on some of the things you said, but I'm just intrigued to understand what's going on inside your head. What's the mix between, like, you've got this process mapped out in your head versus the amount of improvisation you're doing the whole time? How does What does that look like inside your your mind? Yeah, you know, it's it's both a lot. I mean, I, I try not to over-prepare. You've got to prepare some. Yeah. I try to just practice dialing into reading the room, seeing who you are, perceiving you from the very beginning. We do a lot of work with, you know, behind me, there's this book, The Full Fee Agent, co-authored with a guy that teaches residential real estate agents. He was a former NFL player. And his analogy, I think, is fair, and it's the same analogy as any sport. You practice, you plan, you game plan, you look at the other team's tendencies, and then the game starts. And it's all improv- improvisation based on your preparation. So you prepare it and then you improvise. The ball snaps in a football game. Everything, chaos ensues on both sides. You know, the ball is kicked in uh, real football, which Americans call soccer, <laughs> <laughs> or whatever it is. When the game starts, it's complete improvisation based on your preparation. Chris, if we could go back to some of the examples that you gave and and you in these moments, in these high stakes situation, I'm fascinated to understand the role of the physical body and how you're listening to your physical body and what your physical body is telling you in these moments. Um, what are these physiological cues that are coming out when you're in the moment? What does that feel like? All right, to me, like what am I monitoring or how is that, how is that feeling back to me? Exactly. Well, you know, you're almost getting into a metaphysical conversation here. Uh, So, which is fascinating to me. And what I mean by metaphysical, uh, we're still discovering in neuroscience. So what's my gut telling me? Uh, Any challenge for a person is separating uh, what they're hearing from their gut and what they're hearing from their amygdala, their fear centers in their head. Like our amygdala is massively pessimist, pessimistic massively negative you know ballpark rough layman's terms my amygdala is 75 percent negative you know what are those phrases that people say you know so many horrible things in my life some of them actually happened you know so it's just all in our head so much and it's that being said it's extremely inaccurate now our gut you know what's my gut telling me our gut's really accurate if we can listen to it and, and not get sidetracked by the amygdala. So I'm, I'm often trying to sense what the meaning is, which is a little bit more, yeah, I don't know what it is, but I'm, I'm, my body, my gut instincts are giving me feedback. And sensing in the moment what's coming off of you is going to help me a lot if I'm listening or if I'm looking for insight. You know, what's, what's on the surface of what you're saying? What's really driving you? You know, you're really angry with me. Well, actually, if you're actually angry, you, you, you're under a lot of pressure. But you're not really exhibiting a fear-based response to pressure. I'm, I'm feeling like you're just attacking me. You know, those are two different things. That, that comes from the combination of my experience and my gut and contemplation and discussion of it. Now, other than that physiological care of myself, um, you know, all the cliche stuff. Um, If I get a good night's sleep, if I got diet and exercise, you know, what are the five pillars of health? Diet, exercise, um, sleep, relationships, and spirituality. The more I take care of all five of those pillars, the better negotiator I am because my mind is much more agile in the moment. And can can we talk about the role of fear? So the role of fear when you're in a negotiation. So what have you learned about handle, how to handle it for yourself and maybe even how to handle it for others? Does that come up? Yeah, well, the, you know, there's the, the intellectual override of fear. I mean, fear is a liar. Uh, your amygdala is a liar. F- fear, at best, uh, is a, a ridiculous exaggerator 
if not an out and out liar. So that's something that I need to practice mental hygiene to keep under control. And then if I know that's happening on the other side, tactical empathy, we got very specific things, responses, tools to deactivate your fears. And a really counterintuitive way to deactivate a fear is to simply call it out. I refer to it as the elephant in the room. You don't get rid of the elephant in the room by denying it's there. Because then the people say, what are you, crazy? There's an elephant right here. You know, you're delusional. You ignore the elephant. At least the outcome is not as bad as denying it. The worst thing you could do is deny a fear. Ignoring a fear then uh, makes you look oblivious. But the two millimeter shift on fears is to simply call them out. And that's what really blows people's minds. First of all, they've never heard anybody call out fears before. They'd say, I don't want you to think I'm being disrespectful. That's the denial of the elephant, the denial of the fear. And they re every time we teach them, no, instead say, it probably looks like I'm going to be disrespectful. Like, oh, no, no, no. When I did that in the past, it blew up. Well, in point of fact, what you did was deny it. You just didn't understand the difference and you did it by accident. And there have been neuroscience experiments that have been duplicated a number of times. They put people in fMRIs so they can watch sort of the mental activity in their head. And they show them pictures that induce negative emotions. Whatever those pictures might be. Might be a puppy in the rain, might be a child begging for food. You know, it doesn't matter. But they induce negative emotions. The fMRI lights up functional magnetic resonance imaging showing either electrical activity or blood flow. I'm not sure which one it is in the head. In predictable areas where roughly the fear centers are, um, that's an imprecise location, but eff effectively about three quarters of the amygdala and some other components, they light up. And then they simply ask people to identify the negative emotion. Self-label, if you will. I, what are you feeling right now? Anger, fear, concern. And every single time, you simply identified it. Every time, the electrical activity diminished. Now, the important aspect of that is the degree of impact changes. The type of impact doesn't change. Calling it out diminishes it. Sometimes you call out one negative emotion, and it all goes away. And other times, you got to call it out five times to get it to go away. So what, what does that mean in a negotiation? What that means is I'll, I will call out what, you're, what I sense you're feeling, or here's the other part that really scares people. I'll call it out in advance and it inoculates. Hmm. And people think, oh, I can't. I can't speak the devil into existence. If I give them a fear, then they're going to say, well, I wasn't thinking of that, but thank God you mentioned it. Now I am. You know, I never thought you were wasting my time, but when you said you're probably afraid I'm wasting your time, now I'm going to think it. Actually, the opposite happens. If I can deactivate a negative emotion in advance, why not do it? I'm teaching in a um, question and answer session. Almost every time somebody asks a question, no matter how out of touch the question is, I try to find something in it that I like. I try to compliment them on some aspect of thinking of the question. A little bit more than saying, that's a great question, which almost every instructor does if they have any sense. You know, I'll pick out what in the question I like. Gentleman asked me a question, there ain't nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> like, there ain't nothing in this question. Like, I don't know where his head is at. He's not paying attention. And because of the nature of the question, I know that my answer is, is going to kind of say, you weren't paying attention. Mm. And so I go, this is going to sound harsh. Now understand, I haven't said anything yet. That, that, there ain't a negative here. I'm looking for an inoculation because I know what's going to happen mm. when I answer this question. It's just going to sound harsh. I wait about a second and a half. Kind of three, a moment, if you will. And I answer his question, which is kind of like pretty blunt and pretty, but you ain't paying attention. And then I move on to the next question. As I'm, as I'm talking to the other person, he says, that wasn't harsh at all. I inoculated him from a negative response. 
I think this is uh, incredibly valuable for everybody listening to this. I'm just wondering how, I mean, you, how you do this in the very most difficult situations that you face where fear might be at times overwhelming. Have you experienced times where you've got close to, to feeling overwhelmed by it? It sounds, I mean, from the perspective you're talking about at the moment, it's hard to imagine Chris Voss being frightened, but t t tell us about experiences that might have pushed you there. Well, you know, I don't, I'm, in, in, the thing I is for me is the type of person I am, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, we believe that the world splits evenly into thirds, sort of analysts, accommodators, fight, flight, make friends. And our data, our experiential data, not academically rigorous, but I'm happy to rely on it, bears that out. Uh, it doesn't matter if we're talking to chi people in China or Western Europe or Africa or South America. The world splits pretty evenly into thirds. So the third that I'm in is the assertive, natural born assertive. Worldwide poster child for assertives is Donald Trump. Like direct, blunt, honest. Talking to us is like getting hit in the face with a brick sometimes. So w what triggers me is anger. And I get particularly angry at being deceived or lied to. That sets me off. So I don't get set off by fear. I do get set off by anger. Right. What do I do in a moment? The infamous late night FM DJ voice <laughs> also calms me down. And when I use it, everyone that hears it, it calms, it soothes our negative emotions, whatever they may be in a moment. And if I'm using it, not only am I using it, I'm dialing it up in my head, which is calming my negativity. But I also hear it one way or the other. So when I need to smooth out any sort of negative emotions, if I get caught up in a moment, if I find myself, and because I'm human, it happens. Hmm. Then I'll shift to the late night FM DJ voice to calm my negativity down. So you've already given us an awful lot to think about as as leaders, but let's just try and make the the connection between negotiation and leadership a bit clearer. What what else do you think your work does to help leaders to be better at that, their jobs? Um, to first of all recognize what the reality of that dynamic. If you're leading, um, you spend people are far lower maintenance. Your guidance takes less time if you're mentoring versus directing. If you're mentoring, you're encouraging people to think, which minimizes the number of times you have to have the conversation. If you're directing, it's essentially didactic instruction, one-way instruction. When the Black Swan Group is teaching a company and we do a lot of corporate training, we interact with you in the negotiations so that we have to teach it to you fewer times. A long time ago, if I just tell you what to do, that's didactic instruction. And I remember in the early days of learning instruction, I don't know what the source of my statistic is, but I, I, didn't, I didn't make it up and I didn't do the data. I just uh, feel comfortable this is good. I got to tell you 19 times. How do I get something through your head simply by telling you? 19 times, whether you're an employee or whether you're my child. <clears throat> That's pretty inefficient. And... By and large, we're, when we're bosses, superiors, employers, or parents, by the time we tell somebody something three times, we go like, geez, I told you three times, you still didn't get it, what's the matter with you? Well, I didn't realize that if I tell you, I gotta tell you 19 times. Simultaneously, if I'm encouraging you, if I'm mentoring you, if I don't, if I don't take an approach as a, a boss, an employer, that I'm directing you, but instead I'm mentoring you, oh, I'm gonna change my tone of voice, I'm going to be a little softer. I'm going to have tolerance for guidance more. I'm going to encourage you to think with me. In a point of fact, I'll be giving you instruction far less. And that's a lesson I've learned the, really the hard way in my company because people are interacting with me on a regular basis now. Um, we're up to approximately 
30 people in the organization. At one point in time, it was just me, and shortly thereafter, it was one and a two. And I directed a lot more. And now that I need, I need us to be efficient because I'm a, assertives believe that time is money. And kind of no matter who you are in life, you got to recognize that time is money. It's not the only thing that's money. Relationships are money also. Information is money. But there's a limit to how many hours in a day, no matter what we think of it, how many minutes we have. Time is money. Time is a scarce commodity. How do I make my time most effective in leading my employees, the people that work for me? I mentor them more because it's more effective. You've talked a lot about authenticity and honesty. I'm really interested in how leaders can increase trust in relationships and within teams. What else have you discovered in terms of accelerating trust? Well, substitute the word, take the word trust out, put in predictability. Like the less you get people caught off guard, uh, the more they trust you. <clears throat> and what does that mean? Uh, you get some negative feedback to give somebody. Let them know that negative feedback is on the way. You're not going to like this. This is going to seem harsh. You're going to think I'm being unfair. Of course, that's what you're, the people that, that you're, that work for you, as soon as you, start to criticize or take issue with what they've done. They're going to think it's harsh. They're not going to like it. They're going to think you're being unfair. Warn them it's coming in advance. That increases trust. Let, let them know. Don't, don't let them dangle. Um, give, them, give them the feedback as soon as possible to get them on track. Let your guidance evolve. The smarter you get, be willing to be smarter today than you were yesterday. What do I mean by that? I'm adopting very strongly these days, uh, a, basically a phrase I uh, heard from Jeff Bezos. And Bezos is saying, do as you're told, unless you have a better way. And I want to hear it when you have a better way. <clears throat> now understand the difference between better and different. Like, I need you to follow my instructions, and I need you to be really good at it unless you have a better way. Now, if your answer is, that's not the way I like to do it, or I got a, I got a different idea. Different ain't better. And I, I'm very clear with the people that work for me. I expect you to find a better way. If I ask you to do the same thing enough times where you've done it more than I have, then if you learn at all, you're going to be able to tell me a better way to do it. But until you've got a better way, then you're going to have to follow instructions because at the end of the day, since I'm paying for all the mistakes anyway, if we have a disagreement, let me be the guy who's wrong. Hmm. So I'm constantly encouraging collaboration and growth and teamwork and honesty and do as you're told only by itself. Treats people as if they're drones, as if they're robots, as if they're not human. They're not going to grow. They're going to resent it, and their performance is going to decrease. So how do I not get trapped in that paradigm, but also minimize them making mistakes through lack of experience? Do as you're told until you figure out a better way. Because I hired you because I think you're smart, I expect you to find a better way. And I'm really encouraging growth a lot in my direction when, that I give people. Chris, you mentioned um, feedback. You mentioned giving feedback. Are there any other components of a leader's position or any other situations that leaders find themselves in where they can start to flex this negotiation muscle, where they can start to practice these skills um, in the leadership and in the business world where you would suggest leaders double down on that? Yeah, I, I think in, in all aspects of your conversations <clears throat> in you know, I, I think this is related to what you asked me, but I had another thought that I want to make sure that I included, which is the last impression is the lasting impression. So, and this is different than the sandwich version of feedback where say something positive, give them the negative, say something positive. That's a formulaic, no thought goes into it, that um, it's not as bad as just negative feedback. The problem with the positive, negative, positive 
in the feedback is you fail to let people know that negativity is coming. You're catching people off guard. If you're catching people off guard, you're decreasing predictability, lack of trust. So if I've got a correction, I got to say, look, I got a, I got a correction coming your way. And it's going to sound harsh. I could say, I love you. You're a wonderful employee. Now, here's how you're screwing up. But I love you. You're a wonderful employee. Well, in the middle of that, they're confused. You didn't warn them that the pain was coming. Yeah. Now, the, the upside of the sandwich is the emphasis on ending positive. Now, that's critical. The last impression is the lasting impression. It's what I, we refer to as the Oprah rule. Because I, after hearing about it um, in, a, uh, in a sort of a neuroscience conference, I mentioned it to a young lady that worked for Oprah. And she said, oh, yeah, it's Oprah operates by that. Like, everybody Oprah ever interacts with is valued. In the entertainment world, they have a, a phrase, in a limo, out in a taxi. Well, when they worked for Oprah, it was in a limo, out in a limo. Make sure people feel valued at the end. And so take a look at Oprah's track record. Like you go to work for Oprah, you work hard. I got news for you. She didn't build uh, the networks and her billions starting with less. She started from less than zero. If you want to consider her demographic handicaps to begin with, you know, she was dealt. She's black and she's a female and she's from a poor area on top of everything else. Like, so she had no head start in life. Mm. But you work for Oprah. You work darn hard. I've I've had interactions with people while they were working for her or people formerly that worked for her. None of them resented how hard they worked and they all worked very hard. Because Oprah always made people feel valued. And if she had to take someone to, to the woodshed, to use another American phrase, the last thing that she made clear to them was how much she cared for them. And that she would always be supportive of them, no matter what decision they made. And that's a way to have people love working really hard for you because she was always finishing with genuine comments of positive regard, no matter what the circumstances were. When you look at the news today, either business or in the kind of political realm, where do you think your most... Where, where's the need for tactical empathy most in the world? Well, I, I've, uh, I think everybody, empathy is, a, there's no downside for empathy, uh, empathy for anyone anywhere, no matter the intensity of the conflict. Because empathy is not agreement. Empathy is just about demonstrating an understanding of the other side. And it's not just understanding the other side. You know, it's showing that you understand principally through, look, here's what I think your perspective is. And then laying it out. That's showing somebody that you understand and there, it, it would make every aspect of life better. Now, I've, I've kind of given up on governments and politicians uh, because, you know, a, a book that I've read or uh, am reading recently called Ship War. And they make this, the development of the semiconductors, principally through collaboration with Silicon Valley and a variety of countries in Asia, Southeast Asia, Asia, Taiwan, China, South Vietnam, Japan, Korea, you know, all sorts of contributors to um, the global semiconductor industry, principally in that part of the world. They make an interesting comment. They say the U.S. military lost the war in Vietnam and the chip industry won the peace. And of that, what government ever won the peace? Governments win and lose wars. But the peace is won by the growth of the private sector. Vietnam War, theoretically, was weighted into, uh, not necessarily started by the United States, but certainly weighed into and, and with both feet, to stop the spread of communism throughout Asia, Southeast Asia. And all the military did was lose the war. Chip industry comes in, starts giving people jobs, and you've got the private sector flourishing throughout the region. Even China likes the private sector. And they're theoretically a communist country. So it's you know, governments don't win the peace, the private sector does. And the more the private sector exercises empathy and collaboration with generating a better future for everybody, 
the more peace there's going to be throughout the world. Governments don't win the peace. So is um, uh, Black Swan Group being brought in by leadership teams to help, you know, from a strategic point of view, to understand competitors and customers using this lens? You know, by the by the ambitious ones. Um, now that sounds obvious, but one thing that I've come to be aware of a clear distinction is there's a difference between somebody who's ambitious and somebody who's competitive. The ambitious person, I first got turned, my attention got turned to that trait uh, with Masterclass. Um, I've got a, my class on Masterclass is a, the best-selling course I've ever, ever had, mm-hmm. far and away. They, they even now, in trying to explain it, they even say, well, you know, Chris Walsh's course is an outlier. Nothing, nothing compares to it. Because, <laughs> you know, we still can't quite understand the alchemy of why it's globally so successful. The master class told me a long time ago that their ideal customer was the cat, the curious, ambitious 30-something. And very familiar with curiosity as a, a superpower. But when they said ambitious, and I looked up ambitious, ambitious people are by definition innovative. Now, a competitive person is not necessarily innovative. A competitive person wants to set a goal, and once they reach that goal, then they quit. They give up. And you see it among athletes. The athletes that are competitive only, they have a great game, and then having a great game, the, ne- the next game, they're horrible. Because they had the great game. What else is there to do? You know, I can relax now. I, mm-hmm. I reach my goal, or they even quit when they get near it. Now, the ambitious person, they can't get enough. They want to learn new ways of doing things. You know, their competition is their own performance the day before, not the guy or gal next to them. So we find we're brought in by leaders who are truly ambitious because they want innovative stuff. They love that their people get better and smarter because it's more profitable and their people are happier and they retain them longer. The competitive people, you know, they cut each other's throat within the company. You know, you got a bunch of competitive executives inside a company. They're busy trying to beat each other, not not improve their own performance. Those companies don't do as well over the long run if they survive at all. But it's the you know people, the entrepreneurial spirit, truly ambitious, truly collaborative. Those are the people that bring us in. Chris, I've been dying to ask you this question. Um, you've mentioned before that when a counterpart asks for a win-win in any situation, this is actually a red flag. And that yeah. has really stuck with me. And I'd really love to hear you expand on that. Um, when win-win negotiations first started coming out, the really competitive cutthroats learned that if they ask for a win-win right away, the other side's going to drop their guard. I can say, hey, look, look, hey, you know what I want is a win-win deal. Then people start open. Oh yeah, okay. Well, here's what I can do, and here's what I can do, and here's what I can do, and they lay all this stuff out, and they give away the farm. They give away a tremendous amount of information. You know, they're driven by the hope of. You know, they become a hostage to hope, hostage to the future. And the cutthroat negotiators learn somewhere along the line that if I articulate win-win right off the bat, you are going to be so gullible. You're going to be so drawn in. And then if I can paint this picture of all this great opportunity, if you'll just come in and do this. I mean, I, and I get this all the time. Like, I got a win-win deal for you. I'm going to put together all these rich people in a room. And there's going to be so much opportunity for you there. And all you got to do is come in and give this presentation for free. And then you're going to make all this money. And I'm like, okay, I've, I've seen this movie. I know how this baby turns out. And I started looking for it very much like I started looking for the word fair early on. It pops up all the time. So let me see what this is an indicator of. What does it lead to? And if you're articulating the words win-win, which is not the same as living a collaborative spirit. Me wanting to make sure that you don't feel like you lost 
or me wanting to avoid beating you. I don't got to beat you to win. As a matter of fact, if we're going to win, if I'm going to win big, I need to win big with you as opposed to at your expense. The much more lucrative deals are winning together. Much more money. So that doesn't mean I don't have the spirit of great collaboration. It just, the, the words being articulated early in a conversation correlate extremely strongly with someone who's trying to get me to do something for free forever. So just take that one step further. So when somebody does make you this offer, which is basically a deception, what do you do to ensure that you keep the thing moving forward do you just or do you just shut them down what, what's your next move uh I, we refer to these people as half hard annoying lame and frustrating and there's two type and this is from my friend joe polish founder of genius network it says there's two kind of counterpart two kinds of counterparts elf easy lucrative and fun half hard annoying lame and frustrating it's not a sin to not get the deal it's a sin to take a long time to not get the deal it's also a sin to take a long time to get a bad deal. Now, half is a bad deal. Now, you go to work for me, then early on you think, yeah, Chris Voss, negotiation guy, wants to make every deal. I do not. Not only do I not want to make every deal, I know there's going to be a significant portion of times where you're never going to make the deal with me. So it's a sin to take a long time to not get the deal. Now, what about the second thing? So I tell my business development people probably three years ago, maybe four now, like, all right, so here are these two types, halves and elves. Let's develop a profile for what the halves do and say, the people who are hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating, the pain in the ass people, the Peters. They're going to have a, a behavior profile. They're going to have certain things they're going to say over and over again. They're going to have certain focus over and over again. Let's smell it, and I encourage you to walk away. As you asked me before, do I... Try to make the deal or do we walk away? I'm encouraging my people to walk away. And they don't want to do that initially because they feel an obligation to bring revenue in the door. So instead of walking away, they start pulling data. They start pulling our analytics. How many interactions with the halves? How much time do we put in with the halves? My head of business development comes back and says, here's what we've learned. The people that are difficult, they take us from two to five times the amount of time to make the deal and then to execute the deal. Two to five times as much time. So at a minimum, if we make the deal, we've taken a 50% cut in pay. At a minimum. On top of that, if they're hard, annoying, lame, and frustrating for us, we are for them. They don't repeat. So the people that are difficult to do business with them requires we accept a 50% cut in pay and no repeat business. That is not the way you keep a business afloat. And what we found is effectively there's a line of people waiting to do business with us. And every difficult person is keeping the easy, lucrative, and fun, the good client, away from us. And if we can get the annoying people out of line, then suddenly the people that want to do business with us and want to pay us start showing up much more quickly. Mm -hmm. So our pipeline actually accelerates by firing certain types of clients. I love that. Look, I can feel I can feel the resonance on that experience. So many so many experiences that come to mind in in what you're saying there so that's that's wonderful so f the final question if you've got time to um to to stay with us for a moment is just this about um building our ability to listen um and what you've learned about that because you know, I, I i know that you're a brilliant listener so can you tell us what you've learned about your capacity to do that uh listening is thinking listening is analysis Listening is looking for insight. Listening is me trying to make myself smarter in a moment. Accelerate, accelerate the interaction. Accelerate the deal. And it does. Uh, it, it's, it requires thinking. It requires involvement. Um, it can be tiring if you're not used to it. 
It's like any new skill, you know, meditation. You try meditating, clear my mind. Heck, I can't do that. I'm too busy thinking about other things. <laughs> so they'd say, all right, if you're going to meditate, just do it for 15 seconds at a time. And then you build your ability to meditate. So get it, get better a little at a time. And you're going to find that life is generally much more delightful. And you find yourself hearing stuff other people don't hear. And figuring things out faster than other people figure it out. Or predicting problems before other people even see them coming. I mean, really listening and really hearing the dynamic is definitely a superpower and a strategic advantage, a tactical edge over everybody around you. And I not only am I ambitious, I am also competitive. I'm both. You know, I pay attention to the people that I'm competing with, how they're doing. Ultimately, I got to improve myself, but every now and then I get slapped in the face and a competitor outperforms me. And I'm like, all right, you know, I've, I've gotten a little lazy here. I got to get back to doing this right. So if you're competitive only, listening is a great thing because you will out distance your competition very quickly because they don't listen. What's next for you, Chris? Wow, we got, we got a lot of stuff on the table. Um, Talking, having having a legitimate, serious conversation with a company about probably doing a podcast. Uh, we're expanding globally. We got more and more deals coming at us from the other side of the world. Opportunities, principally out of the United Arab Emirates. It's a pro business environment over there. At some point in time, we'll probably establish an office over there. Um, not only pro business, but it's one of the best geographical locations in terms of access and demographics worldwide. So we're doing that. And then uh, you got, we got another crazy project in the works. We're probably going to uh, start the first business-oriented bourbon to celebrate making great deals and having very serious discussions about that. So there's a lot of fun stuff. And we continue to train. We continue to provide, help people accelerate the prosperity in their life on a regular basis by the coaching and the training that we do. Can I, can I give a, a quick commercial out on how to find out more about that? Absolutely, yeah. All right, so our, our, we put out a weekly newsletter, uh, The Edge. It's complimentary, uh, but that's not really why it's valuable. It's valuable because it's concise and it's actionable. It's going to be one 700 to 1500 word article, which is short and digestible. It's going to give you actionable and useful advice for you to use in negotiation today. Give us your email address. You get it at roughly 7.30 in the morning, whatever time frame, wherever you are in the world. It's also the gateway to all of our information. All the training, all the coaching. We just finished two days training in Philadelphia. we got training coming in, uh, open enrollment coming up in Los Angeles and in Dallas. You want to come in and get immersion. I mean immersion in negotiation. You come to one of our in-person trainings. You'll find out about it by being subscribed to The Edge. You go to our website, blackswanltd.com, B-L-A-C-K-S-W-A-N-L-T-D.com. You're going to get the opportunity to subscribe to The Edge right away. Do that first. Take your time exploring the website later on when you have more time. But The Edge subscription is going to be the gateway and also help direct you to specific things if you are, have trouble making the time to f navigate the different offerings and opportunities we have on the website. Start with the edge. Let that be your, your gateway, the doorway, the gateway to the gold mine. Wonderful. Well, we'll put all of that into the show notes uh, together with links to your book and other pieces of work that you've done. Um, Chris. On behalf of Sarah and I, we are absolutely enamored with your work. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful conversation. Uh, there's so many valuable takeaways here. It's a very rich show, and I think it'll, um, for many people, they'll be listening to it several times um, to, to kind of think deeply about what you've been saying. Um, so we're, we're indebted for you spending your time. We know how busy you are. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. The pleasure was mine. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for letting me ramble so much. No, great. If that's rambling, 
<laughs> bring it on so folks for, until the next time remember the world is evolving are you 